Okay, so we're going to pick up uh, from last class. So we were talking about attack trees and uh, we we're going to run through a sort of long-winded example on HTTPS. So just to take a sneak peek of where we're headed, uh, this is what the attack tree will look like uh, when we're finished with it. Uh, we haven't talked about much of this tree, uh, but I'll, I'll just point out the things that we did talk about. So uh, the root node is we're going to break HTTPS specifically by observing traffic sent over HTTPS. We're going to assume that we're already in the middle of that connection. Uh, and so the only thing that's stopping us, we, we have, you know, electronic access to the traffic. It's just that the encryption that's using HTTPS is stopping us from, from looking at it. Okay, and we have three high level strategies. So the first strategy we'll talk about later is we're going to break into the tunnel. Uh, the second strategy is just see what we can learn. Even though everything's encrypted, that doesn't necessarily mean we can't learn things about the traffic. And then the third thing will be to get the tunnel pointed at us as opposed to, um, as opposed to where it's supposed to be pointed, okay, or have the tunnel end uh, at us. Um, so going back to what we can see from outside of the tunnel, um, we, we noted last week that uh, you can always figure out what domain is being visited. Uh, there's two ways of doing this. One is the lookup for the domain is not encrypted. So if you're in the middle of the person querying the DNS server, uh, then you can see what domain uh, is being queried. Uh, and the second thing is that all your packets, in order for them to get where they're going, uh, they have to be labeled. And so you're going to label them with the IP address. Uh, the IP address is not a secret, like the, the mapping between a domain and, and an IP address is not a secret at all, okay? That's what, what DNS is for. And so you can see a packet go by, you'll see the IP address, you can do what's called a reverse DNS lookup and figure out what domain is, is being visited. So um, even if you can't see the content, it's kind of like an envelope. So the encryption is like an envelope and you can see what's labeled on the outside, which is the IP address. You can't learn what's inside the envelope. Um, but you can still figure out what domains being visited. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about these things uh, this class. And then uh, the last thing is you can always store the traffic, you know, hope that you can break it in 20 years. Okay, so uh, the attack we're going to talk about is, is next is, is called fingerprinting. Uh, let, we'll just go through an example. So let's say I go to Wikipedia and I want to look at the article for my favorite soccer team, uh, Newcastle, which is open here. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at this website now. Uh, you can see that there is a lock. And so it, this website was given to me over HTTPS. Okay. Now let's say that we're in the middle and we saw my request for this website go by. We saw Wikipedia send uh, the website back to me. Uh, you know, what can can you figure out that I'm looking at? Say new. You know, you already know I'm talking to Wikipedia, okay? But what you shouldn't know is which exact website I'm looking at, okay? So you shouldn't know that I'm reading about Newcastle as opposed to someone someone else, okay? Um, and so the question is, could you infer uh, that I was looking at at this website even though it's protected using encryption? So. To help think about this, let's just kind of break it down step by step. So what happened in terms of me going to that website? So I'm here and I wanted to get that website. So the first thing I had to do, as mentioned, is I have to go to DNS. And so I say, hey, DNS, I want to go to, you know, nenglish.wikipedia. I won't put the whole thing in. Uh, dot wikipedia dot org. Uh, can you give me the DNS? Now, uh, the, sorry, the the IP address uh, for for this website. Now, DNS itself could be multiple servers, so the the request might bounce around. Uh, but we'll just treat it abstractly as as a single entity, and so it will reply with some IP address. Let's say two hundred eight dot eighty dot one five four dot two, two, four, or whatever. Okay, so that's not necessarily going to be the same. Um, and so now we have the IP address. Okay, so now we're ready to send traffic to the server. We don't know where the server is, right? We just, 
we send traffic to the first router that we know about with this IP address. And then everything's organized hierarchically so that, that uh, the internet will figure out where it's going, okay? We're going to ignore those routing details. They don't really matter. We're just going to assume that we have a direct connection uh, to it, okay? So the first thing I want to do is I want to get the website, okay? So I, I'm going to assume that I already know, say, the URL of, of where I'm going. Maybe I found it from Google or something like that, okay? So what I want to do is I want to get basically slash wiki slash newcastleunited.fc. Okay, so the request I send is called a get request. And then it basically has the path to, to what, what I want. I forget, I forget already what it was, but it's something like this. I'll just try and keep it short, okay? So we're, we're like, okay, give me the thing that's at, at this particular path. Um, and then Wikipedia will send back. What's called the response. And the response will basically be an, uh, an HTML document, article.html or something like that. Okay. Um, so that's what gets sent back. Not, not this as a string, but the actual HTML file. Okay. Uh, and then now I'm looking at it. Now, in terms of encryption, uh, you can recall that uh, here there is no encryption. Okay. So this is. Plain text. So an adversary can can if the adversary is sitting here, they can they can learn that I'm going to Wikipedia at least, okay. And uh, the the traffic that's sent here is over HTTPS. Okay, so it's protected by the tunnel. Now, the modern web, the way it works is when I download this HTML file, I'm not done, okay? So if we go back to the article, uh, you can see that, for example, here's an image. There's a logo here. Is that logo embedded in the HTML file? Like, like the, the, the actual bits to draw out that image, are they in that uh, first HTML file? And so there's the possibility, I suppose, that it is, but, but you, that would be very atypical. Usually what would happen is that this would be a separate image. Uh, it's going to be located at its own URL. And the HTML basically says, okay, um, you know, you, you just downloaded this website. Now I want you to go and fill in this image, okay? And so in order to fill in this image, uh, what I want you to do is I want you to go to wherever the image is, right? So it's at wiki slash file colon Newcastle United uh, dot SVG. SVG is a, a, an image format. So I want you to go to that URL and I want you to grab the image and here's a spot to put it. Okay, so I, I have this box here, this frame, and you know, I want the image in the frame and it's going to be this many pixels by this many pixels, whatever. Okay, but uh, you have to go in and you have to go back to the website and, and get that particular image. Okay, so this image isn't necessarily, you know, on Wikipedia as well. Okay, it might be at a different URL. I, I believe, if I recall, it was Wikimedia, which is still owned by Wikipedia, but it might be a, a different physical server. Uh, but, but, you know, the image could be on Google or, or anywhere. It could be somewhere totally different. Okay, um, and so what you'll do is you'll go and you'll say, okay, I want to get the image. logo.svg or whatever it is and uh, then you'll the response will be the actual file okay and then you'll do that for you know the rest of the website okay now here's the question I want you to think about we know that when we ask for the original article, 
we know that that came over HTML. Okay, we know that because there's a lock up here. But when we did this secondary request, and we you know went and grabbed the image, did that go over HTML or sorry HTTPS or not? Okay, was that encrypted? Is there is there a tunnel that protected this secondary load of the image? or not, okay? And you can think about, let, let, let's assume for example that it, the answer is no, it, did, it was not encrypted, okay? So I, I have a page and now what I have is I have a situation where some of the website is coming down over HTTPS, so it's coming down in a secure way. But then, you know, I'm going over, I'm grabbing this picture and I'm grabbing it over just normal HTTP. It's not encrypted, okay? And of, of course, that means the adversary in the middle, they could replace this picture with a different picture, right? Or they could see the actual picture itself and, and what it looks like, okay? But you might think, well, that's not really a big deal. Who cares? I mean, you know, the adversary can swap out a couple pictures. At least most of it's coming over HTTPS, okay? And then the question, if you're a browser designer is, okay, are you going to show the lock or not, right? Is there a lock? Does the lock mean that just at least the root page came down over HTTPS, but we don't know about the rest of, of the stuff that's on the website. We're going to show the lock. Or does the lock mean that everything, 100%, everything you're looking at on this website, every little picture, logo, JavaScript, whatever, whatever got loaded, all of it came down over HTTPS. Uh, and if there was even one little thing that did not, then we wouldn't show the lock at all. Okay, so this situation uh, is uh, called mixed content. And uh, the things that are coming down, the images, the, the um, you know, the, the JavaScript, the fonts, all that kind of stuff, uh, we call resources. So they're web resources. Okay, so, so you have mixed content. So you have resources, uh, some are over HTTPS, including the original. So if, if the very first thing you get is not over HTTPS, then it, it will not show the lock, period, okay? Um, but if the first thing comes over HTTPS and then it loads secondary resources uh, that are over HTTP, okay, the question is, do we show the lock or not? Does the browser show the lock? Okay. And so the answer to this question has evolved over the years. Okay. So originally it would show the lock as long as the original page came over HTTPS. It didn't care about secondary resources. Then someone realized, well, these secondary resources are important because, well, some of them are, are more important than others. Okay. So we can split them into what we call active content. and passive content. And I apologize for the writing. My computer's been very laggy. Um, okay, so active content or passive content. So active content would be things like JavaScript. Uh, it could be other um, like kinds of scripting and things like that. Uh, so like I don't know, uh, action script or uh, shockwave or flash or like other kinds of things. Uh, C C CSS, uh, which are style sheets that dictate like the font and the layout of websites. They're also considered active content because they, you know, it it's meant to actually be passive, um, but it, the, the language evolved so much, people wanted more and more features. And so eventually it kind of crossed the threshold into where you could do dangerous things with it. But basically active means that it, it, you know, it runs code, okay? And then passive would be things like your images, uh, maybe a font, uh, that type of thing, okay? And so it's just, it's stuff that's displayed uh, but it doesn't run. There's no coding functionality 
uh, with it. Okay, so the second line of thought was um, we'll just care about active content itself. Okay, so all active content would have to come over HTTPS as well. So, so the root page comes down over HTTPS plus all active content, then we'll show the lock. And it doesn't matter if there's some passive content that does or doesn't come down, okay? Um, an another way of doing it is some of them, for a while, they had like a special lock. So it was kind of like they showed the lock, but it had a cross through it, or, or it looked like there was something added to it um, that would make it look like, okay, it's there's, there's a lock there, but something went wrong. There's an error with the lock, okay? So there... They would show a special uh, lock. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll put like an error. And then if you hovered your mouse over it, it would give you some like very hard to read uh, description, but like for, for a novice user, but it would say something about mixed content. And th that uh, was done when actually when active content was, was coming down. Um, so one of the biggest, um, you know, Websites I remember having this problem was YouTube because YouTube videos used to be in Flash and Flash was active content and Google didn't want to host the videos on HTTPS because presumably they thought it was too expensive. And so basically YouTube would always have this like kind of error lock uh, that showed uh, because the videos themselves uh, were, were um, active content uh, because they were Flash. Uh, so Flash includes uh, elements of programming. Whereas now, uh, you know, the videos are just MP4s. Um, and so they, they, they're they strictly passive content now. Um, but anyways, okay. So so right now, what at the end of the day, how does it work? So at the end of the day today, um, if active content... is not over HTTPS... What we actually do is we throw an error. So we will not load the page. Okay, so it will not load. Okay, so we're very, very strict now that all JavaScript, for example, that comes down has to come over HTTPS. It's not just like we don't show the lock. It's like you'll, you'll get an error message. Okay, or um, actually, I, I think I'm wrong, actually. Let me let me put it slightly different. I think the page will load. It just won't load the, the JavaScript. Okay, so it will block that particular file. So if the website will function without that uh, particular resource, then it will still show the, show the website. Okay, but it will basically block it. Okay, and why, why are we so strict? Well, you have to understand that JavaScript is powerful enough that it can rewrite the whole website. So uh, let's say you download, you have some website and, and uh, one little piece of JavaScript comes down with the website over HTTP. If the adversary, because it's over HTTP, the adversary that's in the middle can modify it. And once they modify it, they're modifying coding, right? The code that controls the website and JavaScript can rewrite all the other stuff on the website. Okay, so even the original HTML page that made reference to the JavaScript, that could all get rewritten by the JavaScript. JavaScript could load more JavaScript. Okay, it can open up connections and download things. Um, it can load other kinds of resources and things like that. So uh, once one piece of JavaScript gets corrupt uh, in a particular website, um, in, a, in a user's experience of the website, then the adversary controls everything, everything that the user is seeing. Okay, and uh, passive content we don't care about. So. If passive content is not over HTTPS, we just, we show the lock anyways. Okay, so we just, we don't fail or anything like that. Now, more and more passive content is being served over HTTPS because uh, the performance has improved now. And so people used to worry about like having large images and videos and, you know, it's one thing to encrypt like a little HTML file. It's another thing if you're encrypting video. Right. And so, but now, um, you know, I, I believe if I'm not mistaken, even like, for example, Netflix will serve everything encrypted. It, in this case, it doesn't go over HTS specifically because it uses 
UDS instead of TCP. And so blah, 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 I, I won't go there. But anyways, it uses a slightly different protocol, but it's still encrypted with, with SSL TLS. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the, the Wikipedia page and uh, we can actually kind of see this happening. Okay, sorry, I had to uh, empty the caches, uh, but I'm going to now click on the article uh, for the first time. And so you can see uh, all the information uh, that comes down, okay? And it's it's actually still loading. Um, so there's, there's more and more stuff that's continuing to come down. So there's all these like little images and, and uh, things like that. So I think for every player, for example, they have a little flag for where they're from and, and things like that. Okay. So this, this is a pretty long article. Um, there's, there's lots of different uh, resources and things in it. Okay. So now we're finally done. Um, so at, at, at the end, you can see that we have 93 things that came down with this article. Okay. So it wasn't just... The original article it turned around and loaded 93 other different things okay um uh, so the original document is here uh css is something that controls you know fonts and, and things like that we have some javascript more css files and then uh, we just have a, a whole slew of images uh both png jpeg uh, SVG, they're all different formats uh, for images, okay? Uh, you can see the domain uh, where they came from, okay? And so Wikipedia is very clean because it, it hosts all of its own stuff. Um, and so, so basically you're only loading things from, from two domains, Wikipedia and Wikimedia, uh, which are controlled by the same company. A lot of other websites aren't like that. They're gonna be loading images from, from all sorts of different places, especially when you have ads and things like that that are mixed in. Okay, um, and then you can see the actual names of, of all the files that, that came in. So let's, uh, let me just move this over to the notes and then we'll uh, talk through some of this. Okay, so I, I'm not going to be able to fit uh, all of those resources on the screen, but I'll at least put a couple in. Okay, so we have uh, 94 different resources that came down with this particular website. Okay, so we have 94 resources uh, that came down with that particular website. Um, now, I, I disabled caches, so I went out on the network and, and grabbed everything. Uh, your experience might be a little faster uh, if you've been, because some of this stuff would be common across different Wikipedia articles. Um, and uh, yeah, so we have the original document, and then we have some other different kinds of files here. Okay, uh, you'll notice, for example, this is, uh, you'll notice that if you scroll through the list, all 
were over HTTPS. Okay, so this is not an example of mixed content. There's no mixing. Um, it's all secure. So there's no question that we should show the lock uh, for this website because every single resource, you know, was served over HTTPS or sorry, over uh, HTTPS. Okay. Okay. Now let's go back to the, to, to why we're, we're talking about this is we're an adversary. We're in the middle. Uh, you see me go and load this article. Okay. So you see all of this stuff go by, but uh, because of the lock, a lot of it's encrypted. Okay. So what, what do I actually learn? What information do I learn? Okay. So the first thing I learn is I do know the domain itself. Okay. So the adversary can see this, say it's visible. Okay. It has to be visible uh, because otherwise you can find the server that, you know, it has this file. It's at upload.wikimedia.org. So my request has to find its way to that server. Okay. Um, so that server has to be on the outside of the envelope. It will be in the form of an IP address, not a domain name, but other than that, it's visible. Okay. What about the actual file itself? So both the name of the file. So I want to go get, you know, 29 pixels so symbol support vote dot SVG dot PNG. I want the name of this file in my request. And then in the response, I get the actual file. Okay. So because that particular file is locked, right? What that means is that, that, uh, this is invisible. Okay. Or it's encrypted. Okay, so the adversary can't, they don't know what the name of the file is and they can't see the actual picture itself, okay? And the same applies to the JavaScript or the CSS files and, and all of that type of stuff, okay? So this, this is also encrypted um, because this is in, you know, without seeing the name of the file or opening the file up and looking at it, there's no way for me to figure out what kind of document it is, okay? So this is also encrypted. So you can think of it as, um, let's say I'm, I'm getting one of these files. So I'm going to a URL like upload.wikimedia. And then uh, slash, oh, that's wikipedia.png. So, so everything here kind of is encrypted. Okay. Uh, but this is visible. Okay. Now let's keep going. What about the size of, uh, the, the file that's, that's being sent? Okay, is that encrypted or is it not? So the sort of dirty secret of encryption is, uh, let's say you have a file and it's 1.73 kilobytes before it's encrypted. So that's what this user interface is showing us. When you encrypt it, the resulting ciphertext will be basically the same size. Okay, so uh, encryption is what we call length preserving. Uh, meaning the ciphertext is, is more or less the same size. There, there might be small differences because of uh, padding and, and things like that, but, but basically it's, it's negligible, okay? So uh, files like this, especially in the kilobyte range, they're going to be exactly the same size, whether they're encrypted or they're in plain text, okay? So even though we're looking at ciphertext as the adversary, we see the encrypted file. We see the size of the encrypted file. That actually tells us what the size of the plain text file is because it's going to be the same. Okay, so for every bit of plain text, you have one bit of ciphertext. Okay, so this is visible as well. Okay, and this pattern of like, I looked, I, I went and I grabbed this file, then I had to load it. Like my browser had to, to load it to know that it had to find all of these images. Okay, so then I waited a bit of time and then I got this other file and then I, I was loading all these files sort of like this. This is all like 
also visible. Okay, so this is just network traffic. Okay, so I don't know what is inside of these packets, but I know the kind of, um, uh, first off, I also know the number of packets, right? So if I wait till the end of the person loading it, I know that, oh, they loaded 94 encrypted things. I know the size of them and I know kind of the order, right? Like um, this one's kind of big and I know that uh, this bigger thing was loaded, you know, seventh or, or whatever uh, in, in the flow of all the stuff that came down. Okay, so uh, what ends up happening is uh, is that, yeah, you, you see the, the individual, you know the number of resources, you know the sizes of all the resources, you know more or less the order that they were loaded in. Now, your browser may skip over, different browsers might behave differently. Like there's, there's some reasons why you might load one image instead of another, okay? So it's not going to be exactly the same every single time, but I more or less know, you know, when big files are, are being loaded as opposed to small files and things like that, okay? Now, the question, is uh so actually let me just summarize what i just said okay so let's put together everything i know so i already know because the domain is visible so i know the user is on wikipedia I know that uh, 94, they're looking at some page with 94 resources. I know the size of every resource. And I know roughly the order the resources are loaded in. Now, let's say I go and look at a totally different article on Wikipedia, is it going to have exactly 94 resources? Probably not, right? It might have less, it might have 70, it might have more, right? Every article is going to have a different number of resources. And if I drill down a little deeper, um, even let's say I find some other article that has exactly 94 resources, are they all going to be exactly the same size, right? Probably not. Right, there'll be some differences between the sizes of the 94 resources on a different article because the pictures will be different and you know the different things, right? Um, and then if I drill down even further, the sort of the order in which I load the big ones as opposed to the small ones, I don't know what they are, I just know them by size. Um, you know, that that can also differ. You know, in, in this article, there's a big picture at the top, in other articles, the big picture might not come to the end, uh, that type of thing. Okay, so all of this information lends itself to a kind of um, uh, fingerprint for the website. So each load, you know, if I go to Wikipedia and I visit a thousand different articles, uh, each of them has a unique kind of fingerprint in terms of how many resources are they loading? How big are the resources? What's the distribution of those resources being served by, over time? Okay, so it creates a uh, fingerprint that is likely to be unique, okay? So this is all probability. Um, we can't say for sure it's unique, but it's it's probably, it's probably, you know, I, I would hazard to, to say that it's it's gonna be the only, um, the only article on all of Wikipedia that has these exact same number of resources of, of these sizes, okay? Now, there's always some variability because as I mentioned, if, if these images are cached or things like that, I might not be requesting them. And so when a user does the request, it might look a little bit different, okay? But the question is, could you 
could you go to Wikipedia? Could you go to every single website or every single article, kind of fingerprint what it looks like? And then when you're looking at the traffic, you, you're going to guess which article is the closest to the fingerprint. You know, how successful would you be? And so people have studied this uh, in, in academia. And the answer is that, that for things like Wikipedia, you can, you, you know, it's between 95 and 100 percent accurate. Um, and so it's it's more or less. Uh, yeah, you can you can uniquely tell. OK, so what does that mean? Well, that means that that, you know, even though I downloaded this article, it came over HTTPS. Right? It was encrypted. The adversary that's in the middle should not be able to tell what article I'm looking at. And yet they're able to tell what article I'm looking at just because of the size of, of all the resources that are being loaded. OK, so so that kind of breaks. It doesn't technically break HTTPS, right? Because HTTPS is doing what it promised, right? It, it just promised to hide some information. It didn't promise to hide everything. OK, but it's, it's really not effective at, at actually hiding the traffic itself. OK, so uh, just to take some further notes. So websites are mostly unique in terms of the sort of the traffic pattern from visiting them. And by websites, I don't mean domains, I mean pages within a domain. Right, so the, the Newcastle article as opposed to the CF Montreal article. Okay, and so you can exploit this to fingerprint websites. And, uh, and then you can match the encrypted traffic and try and guess which, which page they're looking at. Now, this only works if you can first, as an adversary, go to the website, look at what are the resources and their sizes, you know, create that fingerprint. Then when the, when the user goes, you have something to match it against, okay? And so, for example, could you use this attack to attack someone's Gmail account? Well, you couldn't because the adversary would have to first go into Gmail and they would have to, you know, fingerprint a particular email address or a particular email message, but you can't do that, right? Because that's protected, right? You, you need to log in, you need the username and the password, okay? So fingerprinting is actually a completely devastating attack. It's, it's really bad, right? But it only applies to websites where the adversary themselves can go and visit and see the exact same content that you see, okay? So it works on public websites, okay? Now, most of the stuff that we wanna keep hidden uh, when, we, when we browse the web, you know, are, are, are things that we log into, okay? And so fingerprinting doesn't work on those particular uh, websites. So it's, that's the good news uh, here. So fingerprinting only works on public websites. Okay, and that's because you need to train uh, basically you can think of it as an algorithm you can use machine learning or something like that to, to, to you know you give it all the articles in Wikipedia that's the training set it creates all the fingerprints um, and then uh, then you 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 know you start looking at uh, users visiting the websites uh, over HTTPS and then you try and match them okay so you train first. Okay, and then there's all sorts of other caveats. Like you say the article changes, 
right? Like the images change on it. Well, then you would have to update your fingerprints before you could start detecting it again, okay? It also doesn't tell you fine grained information. It just says, oh, I've been to this website and this website that you're visiting looks kind of the same, but it's not like you can, you can pull out the text uh, that's going across the encrypted channel or anything like that, okay? All you're doing is you're, you're just matching it at the highest level of the number of resources and the sizes of resources. Okay, so anyway, so it, it, it is a very powerful attack, um, but at the same time, uh, there are some caveats uh, in terms of, of how useful it is to use. Okay, so these are the attacks that I wanted to mention uh, in terms of the this part of the tree. Um, so the... Um, so, so uh, you can always learn the domain that's being visited. Uh, you can fingerprint uh, public websites. You can store traffic for later. And then uh, in terms of mixed content, if, if let's say that, that uh, in the earlier days of HTTPS, you could find some JavaScript that was being loaded that wasn't being loaded over HTTPS, uh, then you could drop your malicious uh, your malicious JavaScript in. And then once it's there, you can do whatever you can record you know, where the user clicks, whatever they type in, uh, you can read the content of the website, uh, you can change the content of the website, so you have complete control. This attack, though, doesn't work anymore because now browsers will block uh, uh, any kind of active content that wasn't served over HTTPS. Okay, I had to switch the software because it was being very laggy, I'm not sure why, but... Anyways, uh, okay, so let's say that we are now done with inspecting from outside the tunnel. So the next thing we want to do is we want to try and break into the tunnel. Okay, so what, what does that mean? Okay, so the tunnel is a cryptographic thing. You may or may not have taken cryptography before. I'm going to assume that you have not. Um, and so we're going to not go through, you know, all the technical details of it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the, the question of breaking into the tunnel uh, down to, uh, you know, uncovering a key. Okay, so the tunnel is essentially a shared key, uh, let's say cryptographic key. So the uh, key is used for things like uh, encryption decryption. And it's also used so that uh, any modifications to the message uh, can be detected as well. So if uh, someone changes things, even if they're just changing at the ciphertext level, it's encrypted, they're not really sure what they're doing, but they're, they're moving stuff around, uh, then it, you'll also be able to detect that. Okay, so um, you're either using what's called authenticated encryption or you're using uh, some sort of encryption like a block cipher, AES, stream cipher, RC4, uh, or you're, and, and then you're combining that with what's called a MAC, like an HMAC. But anyway, so those, those details don't matter, okay? Uh, so basically you have a key, the user knows the key, the server knows the exact same key. There was a cryptographic song and dance that happened before in order for them to arrive at that shared key. Okay, so, uh, but, but now they both have the same key and so they're using that uh, basically to, to, to process uh, all the information, to encrypt it. Uh, what is a key? How's it different than say a password? Well, a key's just, it's a random number uh, and it's too large to guess. So it's random and it's too large to exhaustively search or brute force. Okay, so even though you can try billions of possible keys every second, the number of keys is, is, is just enormous, more than the number of atoms in the universe, and so, and so you're just never going to get there. Okay. All right, so if we want to break in the tunnel, we basically have to get this key. So how do we get the key? 
So, uh, or, or how do we break into the tunnel? So, so the, the option one is, is if we can steal the key somehow, then we're in the tunnel. Okay. And then option two, which is the more crypto heavy attacks that I'll just give intuition about, I won't go through all the details of them, is you can try and break the encryption without the key. So there might be ways of doing some sort of partial decryption where maybe the encryption function isn't perfect. It's leaking some partial information. Um, so that's true of some of the older encryption uh, that was used. And speaking of older encryption, well, what if you can just get everyone to use the old encryption instead of the new encryption? So we call these downgrade attacks. Okay, that, that may also be a path forward. Okay, so let's let's start with the first option, steal the key. Um, and so I'll, I'll show you one vulnerability uh, that, that allowed this particular approach. Okay, so the key is basically it's 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 it has to be in the user's browser. because it's using the key every time it wants to encrypt something for the server. And every time it gets a response back from the server, it has to decrypt it. And it's also in the server, okay? So it's in the website itself. It's sitting in RAM on the server. Okay, so this isn't something that, a key that you like lock up in a safe and put it in a safe, put it on a USB stick and put it in a safety deposit box. You need it, right? You're, you're sending traffic back and forth. That traffic's being encrypted and decrypted. So you, you need that key. Uh, it, it's in active use. So it has to be sitting on your computer. Okay, so if I, if I can breach your computer, um, then I can, I can steal the key. Okay, so breach the computer, you get the key. Okay, and so there's all sorts of ways, right? You could use malware on the user's uh, browser. Uh, now, in this case, what's, what's sort of interesting is that uh, probably doesn't matter that you can attack HTTPS at this point, right? Because you see everything the user's doing anyways. Um, so that, you know, it, it's, it's sort of like it's mission. Once you get malware on the machine, it, it doesn't, you don't have to attack HTTPS anymore because whatever you're trying to learn, you could just learn by observing what you can observe with the malware itself, okay? Uh, but if, if you attack the server, right? Uh, in this case, uh, you're also, you're not, you're not learning everything the user is doing, right? You're only learning about the communication between that user and that server. So if the user is going to other websites, uh, you don't know anything about those other websites, okay? But you do know about the user's communication with that uh, specific server, okay? And so anyway, so you can try and get malware or something like that on the server itself. Um, now, another attack, uh, which was very famous, which is sort of like getting malware on the server, but but I'll, I'll go through the details of it because it's actually a little interesting. Uh, so this is called Heartbleed. And when this happened, it was big news. Like it was, it wasn't just like in the tech community, it would be like, you know, you would go to CBC and, and for three or four days straight, they had articles about Heartbleed, okay? So it was a kind of media sensation uh, outside of, um, outside of the tech communities, it was like, you know, everyone was talking about this when it happened. Um, so this was a specific vulnerability. It applied to the servers and it allowed for key theft. Um, okay, so Heartbleed, uh, basically it came down to a software error or vulnerability. Uh, and the software error was in a library called OpenSSL. Okay, and this is uh, commonly used by servers. Now, users can also use OpenSSL, uh, but you you tended to not have this Heartbleed vulnerability um, for reasons that are, are sort of complicated. Uh, you know, basically, 
you'll see the details of it. It's it's very much a server oriented thing. You know, you go and you ping the server. Uh, you have you know, so it's sitting there. It has an open connection and things like that. So uh, even though OpenSSL might be used client side, this was a vulnerability that was basically uh, just con con uh, confined to servers itself. Okay, and the servers had to have a specific. Um, well, they just had to be using using OpenSSL. Okay, so that was uh, the main thing. So in their stack, they had OpenSSL, and then they had uh, something called the Heartbeat, which is related to this attack. And this is a service that runs on top of OpenSSL. It's inside of OpenSSL. Now, the most common kind of server, actually the most common server period uh, at the time and probably still today is, is called Apache. So this is open source software, uh, something like 40% to 60% at the time of the web was running uh, using Apache. Okay, and if you install Apache and you just say, I wanna, I want to have HTTPS, right? No, it's open source. It's free software. You're you're free to to put whatever library you want in order to enable the encryptography uh, for HTTPS. But by default, if you want to just press one button and turn it on, you're going to get OpenSSL. Okay, so that's the default. And if you just run OpenSSL, uh, it's going to have this heartbeat service that we haven't talked about yet, but we'll talk about it in a second. It will have it on and running by default. Okay, so probably most of these, you know, 40 to 60% that are running Apache, once they're running Apache, they just press a button and then and then they end up in this vulnerable state. Okay, so what's this heartbeat protocol? So imagine you have a client and a server, okay? And your server here is, is it has this stack, okay? So it's running the heartbeat protocol from OpenSSL running on top of Apache. And the idea of heartbeat is it's, it's kind of like a ping, basically. So you could walk up to a server and you might be curious about whether they're running OpenSSL specifically. And so you can say, hey, I, I, I basically, hello, I want to know, you know, whether you have OpenSSL enabled or not. Okay. Now the exact syntax of it is what you would do is you give it some random or any kind of string. So you could give it like A, B, C, D, and then you would tell it, echo that back to me. Okay. And uh, if OpenSSL was enabled and this heartbeat functionality was turned on, uh, then it would echo back A, B, C, D. Okay, and if you sent this and it didn't say anything or you got some sort of error or something back, uh, then you would conclude that, that it's not running OpenSSL. Okay, um, now the final thing that was added to Heartbeat, by the way, no one really used this. This was something that was like put into the code base. People thought it might be vulnerable for like troubleshooting and things like that. So like you're trying to set up your network and it's not working. And so you could at least ping the server and, and make sure that like that, that part of that component of the software was working or whatever, okay? Uh, but, but most people didn't, um, didn't actually use it, okay? Um, but anyways, okay, so, so there was a one extra kind of finesse, uh, which is uh, you could supply a string like A, B, C, D. You could say echo it back. And then what you could do is you could provide a number of characters to echo back. So you could send a string that's longer than what you wanted echo back. So you could send A, B, C, D and say, you know, just send me the first two characters. I don't care. I don't care about the whole string. Just send me the first two characters back. Okay. And so, uh, and so that's fine. Then it would just send uh, the first two characters. And I don't know, that was some sort of efficiency thing or, or something like that. Um, so, so anyway, that's, that's basically how it worked. Okay. Now, the vulnerability came in uh, the following. So consider the following. Let's say I send A, B, C, D. I say echo back. And instead of saying send me two characters, I say uh, I want you to send me ten characters. 
So think about it for a second. Okay, so uh, here's A, B, C, D. Okay, what the server will do is it will take A, B, C, D. It has to store it somewhere, right? So because it has to remember from this transaction to this transaction. So the, the place that you store temporary information like that is, is in RAM. Okay, so somewhere sitting in RAM, it will put A, B, C, D. Okay. And then what will happen is uh, it will it will go back and it will say, okay, I, I need to read the 10 characters. Okay. So it will start here and it will say, okay, I'm going to send A. I'm going to send B. I'm going to send C. I'm going to send D. Now I have to keep going, right? Now, normally if it was good software, it would throw an error. It would say, well, you know, the string that you supplied is, is smaller than 10 characters. Okay. But this was the vulnerability. Okay. This was the error in the software is it didn't check the size. Okay. So then what it would do is it would just keep going. So it would grab whatever was beside the string that it stored in RAM and it would send it back. Okay. So it would send back A, B, C, D plus, you know, what, whatever was in RAM uh, beside it. Okay, so uh, let me just make a note of this. Okay, so the vulnerability was uh, it would send more data back than was supplied by the user. What was this data? It was just whatever was sitting in RAM, the contents of RAM. Now, the way that RAM is addressed from a memory perspective is uh, once you overrun your buffer, uh, then what would happen is it, it would actually grab the older stuff. So it would grab, it kind of goes reverse. It's, it's in a stack uh, kind of format. And so, um, the stuff that's after it, you'd think, well, the stuff after it's the stuff that was added after, uh, but not necessarily. It, it could be stuff that was added before. Okay. So it was the content of RAM. Um, now you can ask for 10 characters in this little simple example, but how many characters could you actually ask for in the real heart bleed? And the, the answer was actually quite a bit. Uh, so you could get 64 kilobytes of memory. Okay, so that's, you know, if, if you're thinking just about text and, and things like that, um, then, uh, then that, that's actually a fair, a fair, fairly large chunk of, of stuff. Okay. Uh, and then the, the final question is, okay, what, well, what's sitting in memory? Okay, how bad is that? Right? Is it, is it just a bunch of system components that the server is using to run like operating system stuff? Like what, what is it? And so for a web server, that's running, you know, uh, it would, a lot of the stuff that would be sitting in, in RAM would be things that the user, other users, other users of the web server had given to the server recently, okay? So it would be like recent data from other users. Okay, so what, what's some of the things that you might be using on a website? Well, you might type your password in, right? So a user types their password in, you gotta store it in RAM because you gotta hash it and then compare it. Then you have to get your password list. You're gonna load that into RAM, right? And now you have the two things in RAM sitting side by side and then you're gonna compare them and see if they're, they're the same or not. Okay, so things like a, a password, um, cookies. So once you're logged in, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to give you a cookie. So I'm going to, you know, I'll put it in RAM first and then I'll, I'll move it into the packet. Uh, and so cookies are, are used to keep you signed in after you put your password in. We'll talk about cookies at the very end of this class. Uh, so don't worry if, if you don't know what they are. Um, you know, whatever identities, files. So one of the big cases of Heartbleed that happened in Canada is someone was just fooling around looking to see what websites were vulnerable. They decided, oh, let's let's look at Government of Canada websites. 
And so they went to the tax agency, CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, and it turned out that it was vulnerable to heartbeat, or sorry, to heart bleed. And so it, um, and so the the person, you know, they just dumped the contents of RAM and they got all sorts of like tax information and, you know, people's social insurance numbers and things like that. Okay. Now, uh, this person got caught because uh, they, they also had intrusion detection or they had some sort of, you know, network monitoring tools and things like that. And so uh, they, they, they got the information, but there was a log of them having run it. And if I recall, I can't remember the details exactly, but I think they were kind of an amateur. They weren't like a, a like a real black hat hacker. Uh, they were just sort of, a, a, you know, someone kind of fooling around. But anyways, they, they got in, in very serious trouble. I think they were charged criminally uh, uh, as a result of it. Um, so anyways, uh, so this is the type of thing. And then the other thing that could be in memory is your your HTTPS keys, right? Remember, that's why we're, we're talking about this, right? So those keys, you're using them, uh, they're session keys, you're using them between you and your users and you have to have them handy because you're encrypting and decrypting all the traffic that's coming in uh, to your server, you're decrypting it, and all the traffic that's going out, you're, in, you're in, sorry, you're decrypting the, serv the traffic that comes in and you're encrypting the traffic that goes out. Okay, so those keys have to be, they have to be sitting there. Okay, and then there's one final piece uh, that, that was kind of controversial, which we haven't talked about, but uh, in order, I mentioned that in order to get this shared cryptographic key, okay, so this shared cryptographic key is what we call a session key. So basically every user, let's say it's Google, they have 100,000 users that are connected to it right now, then it has 100,000 session keys, you know, a different one with each, um, with each user. But Google also has like a long-term key, a key that they use in the setup in order to get the session key with each user. They have another long-term key, okay? And if you're able to steal that long-term key, then you can compromise all the session keys, or at least you can impersonate Google in the establishment of, of these session keys. Okay, so maybe you didn't catch all those details, um, but you have your HTTPS session keys, and then there's also the long-term Uh, we'll call it a crypto key, and we'll we'll come back to this key later because it's it's important. Um, so if you've heard of certificates and that type of thing, this is like the key that's inside certificates. And if you haven't heard of them, don't worry, we'll we'll get there eventually. Okay. Now this was controversial about whether or not Heartbleed could uh, extract the long-term key. Why was it controversial? Well, you have to think, um, okay, so 64 kilobytes, there's a lot of, that can be a lot of passwords and things like that. But for a server, it's not a lot of space. Okay, so the servers, you know, they're going to have, well, nowadays they might have gigabytes of RAM, right? Uh, and so, or hundreds of, of gigabytes of RAM even. Um, and so it, it, it's actually a very small amount of memory. Now, this long-term crypto key is like the very first thing that you load. So you load up OpenSSL, you go and you grab that key, you stick it in RAM, because you're going to need it for everything that you do. Every session key that, that you're going to create, uh, you're going to have to use that key. So it's one of the very first things that gets loaded into RAM. And so by the time the user comes around and exploits Heartbeat, the Heartbeat protocol exploits it using Heartbleed, uh, that key is so deep into memory that it's going to be more than 64 kilobytes away from, from where you currently are in memory. Okay, so that, that was basically the thinking, uh, is that, that it's, it's so deep in memory that, that if you can only grab 64 ki kilobytes at a time, uh, then you're, you're never going to find that key. Okay, so some companies actually went on record saying that we don't think that this is a vulnerability. And it's a big deal because if you can extract that long-term key, then then you know, basically all the websites that were vulnerable to this, they have to go and they have to renew these keys and things like that. So then the security community took it as a challenge, right? Okay, could we, could we exploit this in the wild? And so they had a very clever solution. So their clever solution was actually to combine two vulnerabilities. So they went to a server and they tried Heartbleed and it was true. Uh, that, that key was, was so, so deep into memory that they couldn't reach it 
by just grabbing uh, 64 kilobytes of the most recent stuff in RAM, okay? But then what they thought is, well, what if we attack the server right after it turned on? Like pretend the server turned on, no other users had visited it yet, uh, and we were like the very first ones and we ran Heartbleed. Um, now servers, they're the kinds of things that you turn on and hopefully you don't have to ever reboot them ever, you know, or, or, you know, months go by, like maybe you reboot it every six months or, or once a year or something like that. Okay. So the chances of, of finding some fresh server that, that was just newly turned on is, is really, really slim. Okay. Unless if you could make the server reboot. So that was the idea that the attackers had. They said, well, what if we can find another vulnerability that would cause a reboot? Then we'll hit the server with the first vulnerability, it will reboot, and then once it comes back online, we'll hit it immediately with Heartbleed, and then we can maybe grab this long-term crypto key. And so that's exactly what they did, and it worked. Uh, so they were able to, to pull these keys out, okay? So basically anything that, that was in RAM at any time, you now had to consider was, was possibly uh, breached uh, if you were one of these servers that, that had this Heartbleed vulnerability. Okay, then it got fixed, of course, in, in OpenSSL. They actually just took the protocol right out of it. And so nowadays it's, it's not a problem. So you can use OpenSSL and it's perfectly safe. Okay, another way of sealing keys uh, is what we call side channel analysis. So again, this, this applies to older versions of HTTPS, um, but, but anyways. Uh, Okay, so what's a side channel analysis? So side channel analysis is where you use some information that, you know, like when you do cryptography, you're sort of doing it on pen and paper, maybe you're writing code and you, you can prove to some extent that, that your uh, algorithms are secure and there's no known attacks against them. Um, but all of these are limiting the adversary to like attacking the math of the cryptography. But in real life, an adversary can attack whatever they want. So what an adversary might do is they might attack, for example, the, the timing of the algorithm, right? So if you're doing a bunch of math, then certain math operations take longer or, or less amount of time. And so imagine you have a key, so your key's supposed to be secret. And imagine that it's a binary string, so there's some zeros and ones. And every time there's like a one in your key, it takes slightly longer than if there was a zero sitting in the key at that same position, right? Then you could look at things like, well, how long is it taking to encrypt something or sign something? And then you can try and extract uh, some information about what that key might do. And maybe you can't pull the key out bit by bit, but if you have some partial information, uh, what you can do is you can, then you can do an exhaustive search, but you can, instead of it being like, well, it can be any key, it's only going to be a key that has more zeros and ones or, or whatever. Uh, the, the case may be. So it, it might let you, you know, do a more effective exhaustive search because you're you're getting some partial leakage about what the key might be, okay? Now, the, the details of how this work are much more complicated than I just described, okay? Uh, but, but this type of thing does, uh, it did work. Uh, in particular, when you add padding to messages, that can be problematic. And, you know, sometimes you get errors uh, that come back, you know, you go in, you flip some ciphertext, and then depending on the error, you can uh, combine that with the timing of things, and and, and uh, these attacks get, anyways, very, very complicated. If you want to do a project or something like that, and you, you want something that's more cryptographic, you can look at um, some of these uh, kinds of attacks. So, for example, Freak uh, would be an example of one. Um, sorry, sorry, Freak is not one. Freak is a downgrade attack. Um, so so there's, a, there's a paper by Dan Binet on RSA, and I, I forget, they don't really have fancy names, but, but anyways, you can find this uh, kinds of stuff. Okay, uh, so these are called timing attacks. Uh, there was, there's an algorithm in, uh, that's no longer in HTTPS, but used to be called RSA. It's one of the most famous encryption algorithms. Um, 
And so this was particularly vulnerable. And it wasn't even RSA itself, it was the padding that was involved in RSA, but, but anyways. Um, so, now, so nowadays, by the way, we fix these. So when you do cryptography in OpenSSL today, every single operation is, it takes the same amount of time regardless of what the input is. So they actually test it. They, you know, they'll, they'll make sure that for every single input, even if, if it, you could do it a little bit faster, they basically strip out all optimizations. And so it, it, it runs the exact same independent of the input. It's, so we have constant time encryption and this is why this is one reason why um actually i'll put cryptography because it's not just encryption it could be signatures max that kind of stuff okay now this is why cryptographers will tell you you should never implement cryptography from scratch it's one of the reasons why okay so you could make mistakes but even if you have a bunch of test vectors for like inputs and outputs and you 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 check your algorithm and all the inputs and outputs match what they should be. Um, you're likely to make this kind of mistake. Okay. If you don't know what you're doing, uh, you're going to leave yourself vulnerable to things like timing attacks. Okay. And then there's, you can also look at the, the memory that's cached. Uh, if, if you have access to it or, you know, caching things also influences the timing, right? Things that come out of cache, you know, take less time. Than, than from other parts of memory. Um, so you can pay attention to cache. Uh, you can look at the power analysis. If you um, like say that this is kind of a weird scenario, uh, but let's say you have physical access to the machine, uh, but for some reason you didn't have software access. Like maybe it was in a server cage and it was all locked up. So you couldn't actually access the server. Uh, so you can pull the keys. You couldn't access the memory and just pull the keys out of memory, right? Uh, but, 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 you know, power has to go into that cage. And so you're sitting there on the power line, then you can look and see, okay, how much power is it consuming? And, you know, subtle differences in the amount of voltage that's draw, drawn can give you some information about what operations are being run and, and you can in, infer key material out of it as well. The, the setups, the experiments that prove these things, they tend to be very ideal. Um, you know, so it's, it's not clear. You know, if there's too much noise for this to work in a kind of a real world setting. And a lot of times with these attacks, you have to send like a million packets and measure the timing of all of them and, and things like that. So they're, they're not always like super realistic. But anyways, um, similarly, any kind of electric magnetic interference. Uh, so, rate, you know, stuff coming off of the computer and things like that. Uh, you can use acoustic information. So... Uh, your computer like kind of makes these clicking sounds. I don't hear it so much, but you know, computers in the nineties and two thousands, they were always like, you could hear the computer. It turns out that, that, that like clicking is correlated to the computation it's doing. And, uh, you could also, um, you can also pull information, uh, based on that. Okay. Uh, so anyway, side channel doesn't just work against H HTTPS, it can work against, you know, it's a, it's a big category of attack on any kind of security protocol, okay? You know, so caching attacks work on any kind of software. Power attacks you can do on, I've, I've seen them apply to ATMs. So for example, someone puts in their pin, every time they press a digit, it draws a little bit of voltage. And the, the if you press a three as opposed to a six, that, that voltage is slightly different. Okay, but if you're there and you're very sensitively measuring it, uh, then you can actually tell the difference between a three and a six, and then you can pull someone's pin out just by looking at the voltage. Um, a similar attack was on voting machines. So the voting machines are kind of, they're called DREs, they're kind of like ATMs. And uh, if you press for candidate A or you press for candidate B, it turned out that it would, you know, it would have this like, like if you were listening on a radio, it would emit this kind of like, um, static. And so you could actually stand outside of the polling place and you could have a very sensitive radio and then you could kind of hear through the, 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 like the static that, that was being produced by these machines, which keys, uh, were being pressed. And then acoustic I've seen applied to computers. Uh, we also see it in things like keyboards, you know, like if you, if you want to, I mentioned this in an earlier class, 
Uh, you can actually figure out how people are typing if you're able to fingerprint their their keyboard. Um, outside of of H, you know, HTTPS, just since we're talking general security, um, an, another way to see what people are typing into their phones is if you have access to their gyroscope. Uh, so the gyroscope is the thing that, like, if you tilt your screen, then the whole screen tilts, right? How, do, how did it know that it tilt? Well, it has this, like, very sensitive gyroscope that knows its orientation of the phone, right? And as you type, what happens is you're kind of jittering the gyroscope, right? So if you type on a key that's, like, far from the center of your phone, it's going to jitter a bit more than if you're typing on a key that's near the center of, of, of the mass of your phone, Right, and so once again, using very sensitive uh, measurements, uh, you can actually distinguish, you know, which keys are being typed based on basically like what, how exactly is the phone jittering as the person's like kind of tapping on it, uh, typing in, you know, say a pin to, to unlock the phone or, or typing into the keyboard. Okay, so this is a whole thing, side channel analysis, but anyway, it it also applies to um, to HTTPS. Uh, in particular, if if you uh, try and attack the server. Another kind of key theft you can do is uh, I mentioned it, it's called downgrading attacks. Okay, so when I download my browser, it comes with the capability of doing HTTPS. Now the problem is, let's say I go to a web server and that web server hasn't updated since 1990. It's the same, running the same software that it was running in 1990, okay? That could happen. So my browser has to decide, okay, am I going to throw an error and say, well, you know, I, I want to talk HTTPS and I'm only using the latest version. I'm using TLS 1.3 and I, I don't talk TLS 1.0 or SSL 3.0, which are the earlier versions of this crypto. Um, you know, I, I don't do those anymore. Uh, that's an inconvenient for the user, inconvenience, right? Whereas uh, the other thing you could do is you could say, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll use an older version. Once I figure out the server can only support an older version, then I'll downgrade myself to an older version, okay? And so for backwards compatibility, Uh, a lot of browsers and servers as well, so you could think of it the opposite way. Uh, support old versions of SSL TLS. Okay, and uh, the, the oldest version is actually one where there's no encryption. Right, so so there 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 is the possibility that you um, so the encryption that you use is is actually what what we call a negotiation. So it's a negotiation between the client and the server. So they uh, they agree on basically the strongest encryption that both of them support, right? And it is possible in the very oldest versions to actually negotiate that no encryption be used. You now you might say, well, what's what's the point of, of even doing HTTPS at that point? You still get Max, so you still have message integrity. You still have message confidentiality, and then a very close second is you could negotiate a very weak key, a weak a key that's only forty bits, and forty bits can be brute force. You can even brute force it on a laptop. You don't need a fancy computer, um, and so the the reason that that this was in the older versions of browsers is. When encryption first came out, it was actually kind of treated like a military technology, okay? And the companies that were, you know, sort of, you know, the, the, the first browser was from Netscape. Netscape is a company that's based in the United States. Therefore, it's governed by the laws of the United States. And the United States said that if you want to sell a copy of Netscape Navigator to a Canadian or to someone from another country, um, you're technically you're exporting the encryption that comes inside of that browser and encryption because it's a military technology it's kind of like a weapon so giving a canadian a copy of netscape navigator with encryption built in is kind of like giving them a grenade right or a missile or a, a weapon of some sort 
Okay. And so there were laws that said basically you, you can't do it or you can do it to these countries and not these countries or you can do it if the encryption is not, you know, it, it can be, you know, if your keys are only 40 bits, you can do it. But if there are 128 bits, then you can't do it. So there was anyway, there was all these rules about it. Okay. And one of the rules was that you could export uh, software if it had a 40 bit key because a 40 bit wasn't it was sort of medium level security okay the government could probably brute force it now of course today because computers have gotten faster that's like completely insecure okay um so 40 bits i'll just say 40 bit keys you know very 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 insecure by today's standard okay and so what happened is Netscape originally, they had two versions of their software, one for Americans and one for non-Americans. Now through some, I don't know, somehow they got mixed up or something like that. Uh, they ended up only providing the, the export version that only had 40 bit encryption to everyone. So even Americans couldn't get the stronger one just because when you went to their website, they only offered the one piece of software. They, they, they intended to have two versions, but, but for whatever reason, they actually ended up only having one, okay? And so in those oldest versions of those browsers, yeah, the strongest encryption you could do was 40 bits, okay? Then what happened is there was a, a bunch of petitioning and there, there was some other stuff happening in the cryptography community where it was rubbing up against uh, the laws uh, in the United States. And so eventually they, re they revisited the laws. So in the 90s under Bill Clinton, um, they, uh, they revoked those laws and said that you can export strong cryptography. And so from the 90s forward, uh, then... Uh, then you had strong encryption, okay? But there are very early versions that, that have it. Now, the question is, okay, I installed Safari today. Does it have that 40-bit encryption from the 90s? Like, is that still in there? Is there still some conceivable scenario where my browser might negotiate that with a server? And so the answer for a long time was yes, it was there. Uh, but, but, you know, the server would have to negotiate it. Then it became, no, we disabled it. And then um, some people found out that actually, if you can combine, you know, software vulnerabilities with the fact that this is there but disabled, right? You can actually enable it. So you shouldn't be able to enable it, but you can kind of trick it into it to enabling it. So that was one vulnerability that was called Freak. And now my understanding is it's basically stripped out of everything. So if your browser and operating system are are the current up to date. This isn't even supported, so it's not an option. You'll never, you'll never get downgraded uh, to it. Okay. Now, downgrade attacks also the protocol itself. There were changes to it to stop these downloads, downgrades from happening. So um, basically, what would happen is uh, you would negotiate the protocol, and the adversary could step in the middle. And you know, I could go to Google and say, I want to talk TLS 1.3. And Google could say, fine, I, I support 1.3, but the adversary is in the middle. And this is not happening. This negotiation isn't happening over encryption because we don't have encryption yet. If we have encryption, there's nothing to negotiate. Okay. So negotiation hap happens first, then you get encryption later. Okay. Because you're negotiating the encryption that you're going to use. So this is all happening over clear text. So what happens is is google says oh, i support 1.3 as well and then the adversary jumps in the middle and changes google's response to actually i only support ssl 3.0 so then i get it at my end and i say okay fine i'll let's do ssl 3.0 it's kind of old uh but but we'll do it anyways okay and then the adversary is just in the middle so they keep you know they receive stuff from me in ssl 3.0 they upgrade it to tls 1.3 send it off to google they get a response from google over tls 1.3 they downgrade it to ssl 3.0 so they're just sort of in the middle and if there's an attack on ssl 3.0 they can implement that attack as well okay so so that's you know more or less what happens okay now the change that was made is in when you're done the negotiations and you have your crypto in place you actually use the cryptography to say, hey, we just did this negotiation. Now that we have some cryptographic keys, let me send you a record of what I have you telling me, okay? So what I heard from you before we had our keys was that you wanted to do SSL 3.0, 
But now that I have the key, I'm going to, you know, sign it. It's not exactly a signature. It's a Mac. But, but anyways, you can think of it as sort of signing it with the key. Okay. And then you send it off to the server. And then the server looks at it and says, hey, that's really strange. Because my recollection of the conversation is that I said we, I support 1.3 right? And so they're able to, after the negotiation, they're able to discover the fact that someone was, was messing uh, with the protocol, okay? So that anyway, that's how downgrade attacks are prevented today. But um, downgrades were, were not always protected. Okay, uh, another thing you could do is you could try and recover the plain text. Um, you know, even though you don't have the keys, even though that cryptography is being used, and even though that's actually being used securely, relatively securely. Uh, and so in this attack that I'll show you, uh, you only get partial information. So you can't decrypt everything about it, okay? But it serves as a kind of template. So there's, there's a bunch of attacks that kind of have the same template. So the one I'll, I'll illustrate is crime. I'm just going to give you the high level intuition of it. The original attack was called Beast. Uh, so it exploited a different problem with the cryptography, but it, it had the same kind of setup in terms of the information that you're extracting and, and kind of how you're doing it. Uh, what Crime does is it exploits uh, a, 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 an HTTPS version that also uses compression. Okay, now compression is this idea that you're going to shrink the information, then you'll encrypt it, and then you'll send it. Okay, it's pre pretty simple. Okay, um, compression is not used by HTTPS. So HTTPS does not compress anything. If you want to send like an image, you might compress it by making it a JPEG, right? But HTTPS just assumes that if, if you wanted some sort of compression, you, you already did it. Um, that, that's up to the application layer to decide. We're not going to compress anything, okay? But there were some protocols that did use compression that were designed as, uh, as a replacement for HTTPS. So one was called Speeds. I forget if it was Twitter or Google. One of the big web companies had this. Uh, I know Twitter for a while used it and, um, you know, there was some support in some browsers for it and things like that. I think this has been abandoned now. But anyways, uh, so speeds was one that, that used compression. So this type of attack would work against speeds, even if it doesn't work exactly against HTTPS. But anyways, it, it's meant to give you the sort of the idea of how subtle uh, some of these issues could be. Okay, so imagine you have a website. And so the user is on this website, okay? And imagine that the website has some JavaScript or something that's running on it. And we're going to assume that the adversary controls this JavaScript. So this attack is kind of elaborate. Like it, it's not going to represent an attack on all sorts of websites. It's, it's very specific. But it does show you that, that you can break you know, encryption algorithms, uh, if you, it shouldn't be possible. I mean, encryption should protect, uh, should protect all sorts of scenarios. You know, even if the adversary is JavaScript and things like that, you, you know, encryption should still work. Okay. Um, so they, they have some JavaScript, uh, basically on the website. Now, what does JavaScript do? The main thing that JavaScript does is it lets you open a connection, not the main thing, sorry. One of the things that JavaScript does, it's actually not that commonly used, uh, but it will allow you to open a connection to any server and ask for any information. So you can you can go fetch resources, send get requests. They're slightly different than get requests, but you can you can do that type of thing uh, using JavaScript. Okay. So what you might do is you might say, okay, go over to whatever bank.com. So you're making the user do this, right? You're, you're automatically, the user doesn't even know what's happening. It's just like you put a link in and you say, go, go download an image from bank.com or something like that, okay? And so bank.com will send something back and then you can just throw it away. You don't have to display it to the user. You can do whatever you want with it, okay? The, the main idea is that you're just opening a connection. 
Now there's another subtlety, which is, let's say that the user is logged in to this bank. Okay, so the user is logged in at the time of this attack. We're going to talk about this in detail at the end of the at the end of the course, but what will happen is uh, the browser will take the, the the way the user stays logged in is there's this thing called a cookie, okay? A cookie is kind of like a key. It's like a random number too too large to guess. Okay, uh, and what the browser does is it appends it to the packet that's being sent here. Okay, so the, the browser says, oh, I see that you're sending a packet to bank.com. I also see that I have a cookie that the user stored last time they visited bank.com, so I'm just gonna sneak it into your packet, okay? Um, the point though is that the JavaScript, the adversary that's writing the JavaScript, it cannot read the cookie, okay? The cookies, the browser is the one that's putting the cookie at the front of the packet, okay? so the JavaScript, it can, it can control the packet, right? So the adversary can choose basically whatever they want. Whatever they want to say in the packet, they can choose. And the cookie, you know, the browser does, it puts it there. And so the adversary, they can't choose the value of it and they can't even see it, okay? So they can't see uh, the value that's put there because the browser puts it there. Okay, but the adversary would love that cookie because if the adversary can seal the cookie, then they can log in as the user. So that's the nature of this attack. And we're going to assume that um, the adversary is on the wire. Okay, so the adversary is also sitting here. So they see all the packets go by. But the problem uh, for the adversary is that this is happening over HTTPS. Okay, so they can't read the cookie out. If it was over HTTP, then they could just read the cookie value out. Uh, because it's over HTTPS, they can't read the cookie out. Okay, so they can control the packet. They can't see the cookie because the browser puts it there. Then the browser puts it in an encrypted tunnel. And so even though they're also sitting on the wire, uh, watching the traffic go back and forth, uh, they still can't read the cookie. Okay, so it seems like they're stuck that this cookie value is protected, which is, is the design, right? The design is that even if you get some malicious JavaScript, it's, you know, you shouldn't be able to extract cookies and, and things like that. Okay. Now, the problem with this protocol actually has to do with two things. One is that the adversary is able to choose this. And the second is this idea that it's going to use compression. Okay. So... Imagine, for example, let's just think about compression and how it works. Let's say I have some like random data, okay? And it's of a certain length, okay? So this is the length, you know, it's, it's a couple of kilobytes or whatever, okay? If I run that through a compression algorithm, because it's random, basically the same size will come out. Okay, so the length won't change. If instead of I have some redundant data, like say I have like A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. Okay, you know, I, I have kilobytes and kilobytes of this. Well, all you can do is the compression algorithm could say, well, just take A, B, that's only two characters and just repeat it this many amount of time, okay? So that's the only message it needs to send is basically take AB, which is like two characters long, and then there's another integer that says how many times you repeat it, okay? And that will be the length. It basically took this and it compressed it down uh, to something that's much smaller, okay? So the moral of the story is that random data does not compress very well because there's no patterns Okay, if you have data with patterns, in particular data that repeats, right? It's redundant or there's, it's repetitive, then it will compress well. Okay, and this does not compress well. Okay, 
So let's go back to this scenario. Let's just pull out this little diagram here. Okay. So we said there's a cookie that's put here by the browser. And the adversary wants to know what that value is. And then there's some information here that the adversary, not only can they see it, they're actually choosing it, okay, through, through the JavaScript they have running. Uh, or at least they can control some, some, some of what's in this. They can control some of the information that's in, in the packet, okay? The final thing is that they do get to see, okay, so what does the adversary see? So the adversary sees this in terms of plain text. They don't see this, okay, so the adversary can't see this, but they also see the length of the result, okay? So the browser will take it, it will compress it, and then it will encrypt it. And because of the fingerprinting attacks that we talked about earlier, we know that encryption doesn't hide length. So the adversary can see the, 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 the length, basically. Okay, so what the adversary will do is they'll put basically a guess as to what the cookie will be. So you have the cookie value, they don't know what it is. And then they'll say, well, maybe the cookie has a bunch of A's in it. Okay. And then they're going to look and they're going to see, okay, when this thing gets encrypted, does it come out as basically the same length? Okay. If this, if the cookie does not contain a bunch of A's, then it's not going to compress very well. Okay. But if the cookie contains a bunch of A's, then you're going to compress it because you're going to say, okay, there's a bunch of A's here. Just repeat them over here. Okay. So instead, if the packet comes out and it's much shorter, right, then they'll think uh, that they're getting close, that their guess, it's a good guess. Okay. So they'll sit there and you have to go back and forth. So this is where you're going to, you're going to create millions, maybe billions of these packets and send them with a bunch of different guesses. So you're sort of exhaustively searching. And then you're sitting on the wire and you're also looking and you're seeing, okay, with the, with one particular guess, the, you know, it was shorter. And then with other, with another guess, it, it didn't compress at all. And so eventually you're gaining some partial information. It's not like you can read the cookie out bite for bite yet, but you're getting a bunch of partial information about the kinds of things that might be in the cookie. And then eventually if you do it enough and you run your statistical tests and things like that, then you can have a pretty good guess at what the cookie is. You can certainly beat exhaustive search uh, for, for trying every cookie value until you get the right one. Okay, and so it's basically, um, what makes this attack work? Well, it's a combination of encryption not hiding the length, okay? It's a combination of that with the fact that the adversary is allowed to put, they're allowed to mix adversarially chosen data with secret data. So this data should be secret, this is something the adversary chooses. They're allowed to mix the two together, have it encrypted, sorry, have it compressed and then have it encrypted. The compression is going to leak some information about the contents because you know the, the content of the plain text will change how well it compresses. And then they're able to read those differences because encryption does not hide the length of the messages, okay? So anyway, so you're, you're sort of compounding a bunch of different issues uh, but but the net result at the end of the day is is that that you can it all adds up to an attack where you can actually use this to, to read cookies out uh, out of encrypted traffic. Okay, so uh, things that that uh, um, that are similar. So so uh, we mentioned. Uh, Crime, so crime is uses compression. Uh, there's other attacks that use kind of the same template. So you you try and extract a little bit of information by the fact that you can, okay, by the same template, I mean the adversary controls some JavaScript. They're creating packets. 
and they're on the wire reading the encryption of the packets. Okay, so when you have an adversary that's sort of in all of these places at once, you're attacking something that's relatively small. So a cookie isn't quite as big as a key or something like that. Um, and it's, you know, the browser is plopping a cookie on it. So you have this mixture of adversarial chosen stuff with, with browser chosen stuff, or secret stuff, okay? So anyways, if, if you have that whole architecture of an attack, there's other properties of the encryption that you can try to exploit. So Beast um, exploited the fact that, uh, that the encryption was what we call malleable. So it was not... If you take a crypto course, you might learn about security levels. And so there's something called CCA secure. So it wasn't, it was only CPA secure. And so um, that was the, the nature of it. Uh, there was one called Lucky 13. And this had to do with the padding of the block cipher AES. It was actually the padding that was used in, in the max. I'll, I'll just, let me just put padding. Okay. And then uh, it worked. I, yeah, whatever. I, I could go through the details, but who cares? Um, uh, so it, it has to do with the padding uh, when you combine block ciphers and max. And then there was another one that didn't have a fancy name. It, it was just named after the uh, crypto algorithm, which was RC4. RC4 is a stream cipher. And it turns out that it's not truly random. Uh, so it's uh, it should be truly random. It eventually becomes statistically random, but it it kind of it needs some time to sort of ramp up. It starts spinning out random bits, and they're not random at first, and then eventually they become random. Um, and so you can exploit uh, the fact that the cookie is actually one of the things that's sent first means that it's often sitting in the part of the stream cipher that's not random. Okay, and so uh, and then it, it's combined with the protocol itself not allowing the algorithm to gain the random, like they started using it right away. Like one co common countermeasure is to, to run it for a bunch of ran you know rounds, throw out all the bits, and then hope that it's random from that point forward. Anyway, RC4 also is just not used anymore uh, because it's, it's sort of an older algorithm and we have better stream ciphers that are standardized and, and things like that, okay? Um, so anyways, so these are all attacks that, that kind of use the same uh, template. Okay, so that's at least some intuition for uh, these kinds of breaking into the tunnel attacks. Okay, uh, the last thing we'll, we'll talk about is, we'll spend the most time on it, is the third category of attack in our attack tree, which is to get the tunnel pointed at us. Okay. Uh, or here I say subvert server authentication. It means sort of the same thing, but but we'll we'll get to those details in a second. So I'll just put get the tunnel pointed at us. This is the adversary's goal. So us us meaning the adversary. So let's consider a scenario where we have the user and we have the server and the user, you know, they make a tunnel. So from their perspective, all their data, you know, they're putting into a tunnel. Okay. But the question, question is, how do we know the tunnel is reaching the server? How do we know it goes all the way to the server? How do we know that it doesn't just sort of stop right here where the adversary is? And then the adversary, of course, is, is free to, to relay the information between the server, whether through a tunnel or not, right? Um, so, so how does the user know, you know, for example, they're connecting to Concordia, right? Um, how, how do they know what, how do, how do they know the tunnel ends at Concordia, okay? So the end point of a tunnel is a cryptographic key, okay? It's not the session keys that we were sealing, it's the long-term keys. Remember, um, we mentioned it uh, when we talked about Heartbleed. Okay, so these are the long-term keys. 
So every server has one long-term key. Uh, they might change it every couple years, but basically it's going to be the same key, you know, for for a couple years, and uh, and that identifies the server. Okay. So if you want to know that your tunnel ends at Concordia, you have to get Concordia's key. If you can get Concordia's t key, you can make a tunnel to Concordia. Okay. So it's that simple. So so this. This whole, like, you don't have to worry about any crypto details at all, okay? The only detail you need to know is, you know, here's here's this value for a key. Is that actually Concordia's key? If it's Concordia's key, then I have a tunnel to Concordia, okay? So the, the whole problem is uh, is is just, uh, so, so the, the server, the tunnel ends... at... Uh, and I didn't mention it, but I, I'm going to call it a public key. So this value, it's not a secret key. Okay, so so anyone can publish. Concordia can put, this is my public key on the website and, and write it out. Okay, so it, it ends at a public key. Okay, uh, a public key has a corresponding private key. So I maybe confused you a bit. Uh, when I talked about Heartbleed, um, okay, so a public key is is from a key pair so a public key is from a key pair and so the key pair is a private key or secret key and a public key okay so you when you do things like signatures or just to make this really simple um we're going to assume that this is this is just for signatures because that actually in the latest version of TLS you only do signatures. There is such a thing as public key encryption as well. So public key could be encryption, and there's a way to do HTTPS with public key encryption, or it could be digital signature, and there's a way to do uh, HTTPS with a digital signature scheme. And this is what's preferred nowadays, okay? And it has this extra feature called forward secrecy that I won't go into, but anyways. Okay, so in the signature specific context, the private key is what you use to sign data. And then the public key is what someone would do if, if they get a signature from you and they wanna know whether it was signed correctly or not, uh, they'll use your public key and then they'll verify it, okay? So, um, in Heartbleed, the long-term secret that you're sealing is the private key. Okay, so then you can sign on behalf. You can, if you seal Google's private key, then you can sign things inside the HTTPS protocol that make you look like Google. Then you can actually have the tunnel end at you. Okay, so you can go around saying, I'm Google, I can prove it to you because I can sign things that, that only Google should be able to sign, right? But it's because you stole the private key, okay? Um, but the problem that we have now is, well, how do we know what Google's public key is, right? You could ask it. You could say, hey, Google, what's your public key? But if the adversary is in the middle, then the adversary can just change it. They can change it to their public key, and you don't know the difference, right? Or similarly, I said, well, what if Concordia puts it on their website? This is my public key. Well, you'll go to the website, say, give me the website. Then the adversary will change the website, right? And they'll replace it with their own key on the website right? So there's no way for you to get the key. You know, you, you need to know the key in order to know you're talking to the right person, right? So you, you can't just go up to someone and, and, and ask for their key, uh, unless if you're doing it like in person or something like that, right? But on the internet, um, the only way you can be sure you're talking to the right person is if you already have the key. And so you can't use that mechanism to ask someone for their key. Right, because if you don't already have their key, then you can't you can't ask them for their key. Okay, so anyway, you get into this problem where uh, basically you, you you need some way uh, to know whose public key what what a server's public key is. Okay. All right. So if you if the user has a server's true public key. then basically we're done, okay? We can, we can do a bunch of cryptography and we can make a tunnel. 
and it's quite involved all the stuff that you have to do but um, the, the it all hinges on that fact okay or a different way of putting it is you're, you're making a tunnel to a public key so if you have the wrong public key then you just have a tunnel that that ends somewhere different than than you think okay so the tunnel ends at a particular key okay um, Okay, and so then we will note that the what the adversary is trying to do in our attack tree is the adversary is trying to give you their key instead of the server. And since they can control all your communication because they're in the middle, then they have lots of opportunity to drop their own key in instead, okay? All right, so what do we need? What we need is some out of protocol way of saying, you know, what's Concordia's public key? Okay, we need something that we can't go, we can't use the protocol itself to ask Concordia what their public key is because we don't, we have no confidence that we're actually talking to Concordia. And if we do know we're talking to them, we already have the public key, okay? So we need some, we need some other mechanism that's not inside of this protocol to say, we need a telephone book where we can say, here's all the websites and here's all the public keys, okay? And so you might be jumping up and down saying, I know the answer, I know the answer. Uh, what will use our certificates? Okay, so a certificate is, let's say we, we, we actually go to Concordia. So I go to concordia.ca. Uh, this will go over HTTPS. If I click on the lock in Safari, then there's this thing. It's First off, it says, okay, there's this secure connection. You have this tunnel uh, to www.concordia.ca. And then I can say, show me the certificate. And I get a bunch of mumble jumble stuff. But inside of this certificate is the public key of Concordia. So it's right here. So this is Concordia's public key. Well, we're, we're, we don't know that it's Concordia's. Like maybe the adversary dropped this in. Okay, so, we're, so we'll, we'll get to that detail in a second. But anyways, a certificate basically has, uh, it has the public keys inside of it. Okay, so a certificate, just there's a lot of information in it, so we won't we won't deal with all of it. I just wanted to show you that that you know, this is what a public key looks like, and it's not even all of it. You can see that there's three dots there, so there's it's it's longer than what's being displayed, but you know it's it's a pretty long number. Um, so a certificate basically it has three pieces of critical information, and then it has a bunch of more uh, things, and we'll go through some of these details as the lecture goes on, but. First off, you have what's called the subject. So in this case, it would be, for example, concordia.ca. Then it has the public key. I'll just say PK. So whatever it is, AC54, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And the last thing it has is it has a signature on it. So this document is signed by someone else. And the signature is from something called a CA or a certificate authority. Okay, so a certificate authority in this case is a company called Global Sign. And so global sign is basically coming along and saying, okay, uh, 
this is Concordia's public key, and we're going to sign off on the fact that this is this is Concordia's public key. Okay. Now let's say the adversary comes along, and the adversary says they see they basically you go to Concordia, you say send me your certificate. So this is what gets sent. This thing gets sent across the wire. And then the adversary comes along and they try and change this. They say, oh, I, I, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out Concordia's real public key and I'm going to drop my own public key in, right? Then the, then the user uh, will, will have their tunnel end at me instead of having it end at Concordia, okay? So they just go and they drop this key in and then they send the certificate off. Well, the point of a digital signature is that if even the smallest bit of information, like a single bit, changes, then the signature gets ruined, okay? So a digital signature is binding to, a, to data and it's very sensitive, okay? So any, even a single bit changes, then the signature no longer works, okay? So this doesn't work, uh, so the signature basically prevents prevents this. Okay, so that's great. Uh, so now we have a solution, right, to uh, to the tunnel, right? So, so tunnel ends at a public key. We want the tunnel to end at Concordia. Now we need Concordia's public key. And so we can get Concordia's public key because it's in this certificate. We just asked for the certificate and, you know, it's signed by a certificate authority. And so now we know Concordia's public key, right? Okay, not quite. Okay, so there's a few. Let me raise two questions with this. All right, so I'm the user and I get this certificate and it's for Concordia and here's the public key. Great. Furthermore, this is signed by a certificate authority, Global Sign. Now, how do I verify this signature? Well, the way I verify the signature is I verify it with Global Sign's public key. Okay, so we verify signature. So Global Sign signed it with their private key, and then I need Global Sign's public key in order to verify this. How do I have Global Sign's public key? Okay, I didn't have Concordia's public key. That's why I needed this certificate in the first place. And you're saying, well, you know, you can solve this problem with a certificate. Okay, great. So now I have a signature on that says this is Concordia's public key, but it's signed by someone else and I don't have their public key, right? So all I did is I just went in a big circle where I went from, I don't know what Concordia's public key is to I don't know what Global Sign's public key is, okay? So in other words, let's say the adversary, they're smart. They say, okay, I'm going to change this to my own key, but I know it's going to ruin the signature. Oh, that's fine. I'll just re-sign it with my own key. So basically the adversary will invent a new key for Concordia that they control. They'll invent a new key for Global Sign. They'll sign, you know, th their, their Concordia key with their Global Sign key, and then they'll send it all to me and say, Here's Global Sign's public key. Here's a signature from that key on this other key, and, and this is Concordia's key. Okay, so I didn't actually solve the problem. All I did was I, I pushed it around a bit from, you know, how do I know what Concordia's key is to how do I know what Global Sign's key is? So this is the exact same problem that we just had. So we didn't actually solve the problem, okay? We, we just, you know, we, we solved the problem by creating the same problem. Now there's a second issue, which is, let's say that somehow we solved this problem. How did the CA figure out, right? The CA is saying, hey, I know that this is Concordia's public key. Okay, that's fine. How did the certificate authority figure it out? Okay, so how does the CA you know, what makes the CA so special that they can figure it out?
And however they figured it out, let's say they have some method, why can't I just do that? I mean, this whole thing started because, you know, I want to know Concordia's public key. So if the CA can figure out what Concordia's public key is using some method, then why don't I just use that method and then I don't even need a CA? Why do, why do we even have certificates, right? How, the, you know, Global Sign figured it out somehow. If they can figure it out, then I can figure it out too, okay? We don't need Global Sign at all. So why can't Alice do the same? Okay, and if, if she could, then we don't we don't need certificates or CAs or any of this stuff. Okay, so hopefully, you know, a lot, most people know about certificates, but until you think deeper about it, you realize you don't realize necessarily that it doesn't actually solve the problem that it sets out to solve. Okay, so we need something more. All right, so there are solutions to these two issues. They, they might not be the solution that, that you think is great, uh, but, but anyways, they, they, they are what they are. Okay, so let's deal with the first issue. Okay, so how do we figure out the CA's public key? We have this problem. I don't know what Concordia's public key is. I have a certificate signed by CA. Now I don't know what the CA's public key is. Okay, and the answer is that we're going to hard code keys into computers. So I go to the Apple store. I buy a brand new MacBook Air, never turned it on, never connected it to the internet, it's going to come preloaded with some keys. And it's going to come preloaded specifically with CA keys because there's 2 million websites that need certificates. That's too many keys to come preloaded with, right? And so the thinking is, well, we'll preload a bunch of CAs and then these CAs can hand out the keys to the, to the websites, okay? So we, you could you could take this further and say, we'll just hard code Concordia's key. So you buy a computer and it's already there, right? Um, but then you have problems of like, well, what if it's a brand new university and it, it came into being after you bought your computer, then how do you learn about it and things like that, right? So the, the mechanism basically is that you, um, you, uh, you, you pick a bunch of companies and these companies will turn around and hand out the keys uh, to websites, okay? Um, so it's preloaded with CA keys. Uh, it's preloaded either in the operating system. So uh, Mac, for example, or Apple, uh, Windows, put them in the operating system. Or it might come with the browser. So Firefox uh, has its own uh has its own certificate store. So if you're running Firefox on Windows, you technically have two sets of CAs. You have the set of CAs that come with your operating system and the one that comes with your browser. In this case, it would prefer to use, the browser would, would use itself. So Firefox would use it, but if you switch to Internet Explorer, then you would switch to Windows, okay? Now that said, the, the list of CAs look almost the same across all of them, because if there was one that was in Firefox, but it wasn't in Windows or Apple, then the websites that, that had it signed would only work with Firefox. It wouldn't work with anything else. And, and people don't want to be in this situation where their website works for some users and not others. Okay, so they're always going to choose a CA that is in all the possible stores. And so over time, they basically, all these lists look the same. Okay, uh, how many CAs are there? So let's take a look actually. Um, so on Apple, uh, there's something called Key Store. Sorry, it's called Keychain. My bad.
Okay, and so here they are. Um, so AAA Certificate Services, AC RAS, AC VARA Z1, Act Alice, Affirm Trust, uh, Amazon Apple, you know, and if you go through, you can see uh, all of them, okay? Now, the first thing that might strike you is before I ask the question, um, I don't know about you, but if, if I didn't know anything about this area and you asked me how many certificate authorities, I think, well, you don't need that many. You know, maybe there's five or 10, okay? But what we have instead is we, we have a lot. We have something like 50 uh, CAs. Say maybe 50 plus, okay? Uh, most of these are you know, companies you've never heard of. So Apple, Amazon, you've heard of, but most of these companies you've probably never heard of. So maybe I'll just say a lot of. Okay, so you might be surprised by the number of them. You might also be surprised by um, uh, who they actually are and, and the fact that they're, they're not really recognizable brands. And why is that important? Why does it matter if there's, let's say there was 5,000 CAs, right? Is that, is that uh, any more or less secure, right? Uh, does it matter if there's more or not? And so the key point uh, for HTTPS and certificate authorities is that any certificate can issue a web can issue a certificate for any website. Okay, so if you remember one thing from this lecture, that's that's the key point uh, that that you need to remember. And so what that means is if and any CA if any CA can issue a certificate for any website, then if an adversary can control any one CA, then they can control the certificates for every website. They can issue new certificates that have their key and they can sign them, okay? So they can basically intercept traffic to any website, okay? And so the more CAs you have, it's kind of like the weakest link, right? You need, the adversary only needs to corrupt one of them. If they can, if they can breach one of these certificates and sign certificates on their behalf, one of these certificate authorities, then they can sign certificates for any website on the internet, okay? So any CA can sign a certificate for any website. Okay, so you have 50 companies to choose from and you can try and breach them. But the truth is, it's, it's actually a little bit worse than that. There's, there's more CAs than what you saw. So you saw this list of CAs. Now these CAs are actually what we call root certificates. So the way a certificate often works is, let's say we have Concordia. So they're over here, okay? So here's Concordia. Here's their public key. And it's signed by some CA. Let's call it CA1. Okay. Now CA1 might be a certificate that's in this, this set of certificates that's on your computer, but the protocol allows for that not to be the case as long as ultimately these signatures chain back to something that was signed here. Okay. So what you might have is you might have certificates in the middle. So for example, you might have CA1 and you're saying, well, I want to check this signature. How do I know it's CA1's key? Well, CA1 and CA1's key is in some other certificate that's signed by CA2. Okay. And CA2, how do I know their public key? Well, here's another certificate that says what CA's public key is. And it's signed finally by a root CA. Okay. And then this root CA, I can go into key store, or sorry, in uh, keychain or whatever on my operating system or in my browser, and I can see uh, that, that, that this root CA is inside of this list, okay? So this is called a root. 
this is called a site certificate. Okay, so it's the far end. And you might say, well, then could Concordia turn around and issue a certificate for someone else? And so the answer is that CA certificates, there's a special flag in the certificate that says you're a CA, which means you're allowed to, to, to issue certificates. So the site certificate will bind together Concordia and their public key, but they won't be allowed to issue a certificate. So we'll, we'll come back to that. That will be relevant later, okay? But anyways, and then these guys in the middle, CA1 and CA2, they're called subsidiary or intermediate CAs, okay? So we had millions and millions of sites. I don't know how many it was. It used to be 20, or sorry, 2 million, but it's probably more than that. Uh, 2 million of these certificates floating around on the internet, right? 2 million sites that, that support HTTPS. When I looked in Keychain, I saw maybe 50 plus organizations. Now, what about these intermediate certificates? How many are there? The answer is I don't know because they're not on the list of my computer, right? So you never see an intermediate CA until you visit a website that chains through it on the way back to a root certificate, okay? So I can see the number of root certificates, right? But I have no idea how many intermediate CAs there are, okay? So there's no lists for intermediates. Now this is changing a bit with a project called Certificate Transparency, uh, but I'm, I'm going to ignore that for now and just say that there's no list. Um, you know, you, 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 they come into existence when you see it. And by the way, how, how do you find these certificates? Well, the website, it's their job to actually send you the full chain. So when you go to Concordia, if they chain through a bunch of intermediates, it's their job to send you the whole chain. Okay, so that's that's how you're going to find these intermediate certificates. So uh, they you only know they exist when you see them, you know, when you're given them by a website. So a website says, oh, these are my intermediates. Okay, um, so one way to figure out how many intermediates there are is just to visit every website. Okay, now that sounds kind of crazy, but it in at least IPv4, you can do that. So with IPv4, uh, you can visit every single IP address, okay? You can't do it with IP, IPv6, it's too big, okay? But you can visit every address. You can see if you get a certificate. You can try HTTPS, and if they send back a certificate, then you can record it. So some researchers have done this over the years, and when they do this, they find that there's about 200 more companies I've heard, I've seen it as high as 600. So 200 to 600 new companies, in addition to these 50 that are able to issue these certificates, okay? So once again, any CA can sign a certificate for any website. So if the adversary wants to end your the tunnel at you, sorry, if the adversary wants to end your tunnel at them, they need, well, one way they can do it is by getting a CA certificate right, for the website you're trying to visit and their key, and they can do that by breaching a CA. And so now they, not not only do they just have 50 to choose from, they have somewhere between, you know, they have hundreds of companies to choose from, okay? They can find any one of them and it's vulnerable and they can either steal the signing key or they can just subvert the issuing process in order to get issued these certificates. Then they can have a Google certificate, they can have a Facebook certificate, they can have any certificate they want and they can use it in a man-in-the-middle attack uh, in order to, 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 to end the tunnel at them, okay? So in the last thing I'll just note is that uh, the, the big problem with this model is it works on the weakest link. So uh, you, you just breach any CA. Doesn't matter if it's a root or an intermediate. An attacker can subvert HTTPS for any website. It's not like they could only do it for some, okay? It doesn't matter what website, you know, maybe Google 
well, Google is their own certificate authority. So Google always uses Google. Okay. But you know, you, you get some certificate from DigiNotar, some CTA that CA that nobody's heard of. It doesn't matter because, because it's not humans that are looking at it. your computers looking at it. Peter just says, I see a certificate. It's for Google and it's signed by this DigiNotar thing. And if I trace it all the way back to my root certificates, it's there. Right. So I, what do I care? Right. I don't know. Now, that's not entirely true of Google because Google is big enough that often browsers, especially Chrome, which is owned by Google, it's going to come hard coded with Google's actual public keys. OK, so you wouldn't get away attacking um, users of Chrome by issuing fake Google certificates. Chrome would actually notice it and it actually phones home and, and tells Google about it. And then Google will investigate DigiNotar and then, uh, you know, but 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 anyways, if you attack Concordia or some smaller website that 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 you know the browsers and the operating systems don't know about, then you can certainly get away with it. Okay. So uh, anyway, so so what are the sort of compounding factors here? So we have fifty roots. We have another 200 to 600 intermediates. Uh, these are international companies, so they're not all, you know, in the U.S. where a lot of these browsers are made. So what that means is that a government for example, might go to a CA and say, we have a warrant and we want, we want your private key. And then they could turn around and, you know, if they want to spy on their citizens, right, they can, um, they can uh, just issue certificates. You know, the, the user is going to Facebook, government wants to know what they're, they're doing on Facebook. Then they just go over to some CA that's in their company, uh, or sorry, in their country, Right, they get a warrant uh, that says, "Give me the the key," and then they manufacture a Facebook certificate that's signed by this particular CA. They drop it in uh, when when users are visiting Facebook, and the users won't know the difference unless if they click on the certificate details and and somehow notice that it seems off. Um, but generally, you wouldn't know what CA Facebook actually uses, right? Um, so so. We've moved from a technical attack to like kind of a legal attack, right? And an example of this is um, in the UAE, uh, there was there was a telecom that was caught putting malware on. It's the biggest telecom in the UAE, and they they put malware on the phones of some in a firmware update, and it seemed to be government or state sponsored malware. And so it was very controversial when that happened. Then people realized, oh, hey, this exact same company, they, they're an intermediate certificate. Or actually, I think they were a root certificate, right? And so, you know, they, they already did this thing with the malware. Do we really trust them to be issuing certificates? They can issue a certificate for any website on the internet. And then there was a big petition to have them removed. Um, and then I think the final outcome was actually that they weren't removed. But anyway, people were, were trying to to um, to have them removed. Okay, so anyway, so so you you basically you have a lot of targets. You can target them technically by trying to breach them, or you can use warrants or, or whatever you want to. Okay, so that answers the first question, right? The first question is how does Alice verify the public key of the CA? Well, the answer is it comes hard coded or it chains back to something that's hard coded in their computer. The second issue will be what we talk about next class, which is how did the CA figure out what Concordia's public key is, right? And why can't Alice just use that same mechanism? Then we don't need CAs at all, okay? So I'll uh, see you uh, next week.